Coming up on Tech News today, Microsoft's updating Windows 8 at the last moment. They're also moving Office onto Android and iOS and getting twisty with Lenovo. Also privacy. That and more next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, October 10th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by MailRoute, email filtering in the cloud for companies and resellers of any size. MailRoute offers live human support and one-click sign-up for free Postini migration and 10% off the life of your account. Visit MailRoute.net, click the sign-up button, and enter the promo code TNT. And by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. Plus more than 50 new features, including mobile responsive designs. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT10. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each day with the top 10 in the news views. Now, Samsung may often be accused of imitating Apple in lots of things, but surely you will not accuse them of imitating them and keeping secrets. Uh, you know that rumored Samsung Galaxy S3 Mini? Can't wait until October 11th announcement to find out what it's all about. Well, spoiler alert, J.K. Shin, and I'm pretty sure the J.K. does not stand for just kidding, is head of Samsung Mobile Communications and confirmed to the Korean press that his company will release a 4-inch version of the Galaxy S3 on October 11th in Germany. When The Verge went and said, hey, Samsung, your, your Korean guy's saying this. They're like, yeah, it's true. That's J what we're going to announce. Does J.K. Rowling stand for just kidding? <laughs> it does. Oh, okay. That's ah, the whole Harry That's Potter thing's not true. From. I'm just kidding. Twitter reportedly acquired video sharing startup Vine, which you may not be familiar with because it hasn't officially launched yet. All Things D reports it's possible Vine could still launch as a standalone service, but there's been no official comment at this time from either company. Twitter does seem to be taking video more seriously than ever, though. Yeah, Twitter's got vines and branches, all kinds of fun stuff. eBay news ahead. Ahoy! The company introduced a new eBay today, which is curated and will suggest products to you based on your past purchases and your searches. There's a new wish list feature that has a lot of people saying it looks like Pinterest. Also, eBay's same-day delivery service, eBay Now, is live and available to everyone as long as you are in San Francisco or New York. So wait, same-day delivery, that's same huge. Delivery, yep. Wow. But not, not for the auctions, just for this. Uh, following on last week's Best Buy shelf leak, Slingbox has officially announced two new models, the 350 and 500, as expected. The Slingbox 350 at $179 adds an integrated IR blaster and 1080p HD. The $299 Slingbox 500 adds Wi-Fi and HDMI input and output, which can handle streaming videos and photos from your mobile devices. Both devices should be available October 14th in the United States and following on in Canada in November. Microsoft product manager Peter Boba confirmed that Office 2013 is coming to iOS and Android in March next year. A press release from Microsoft's Czech Republic team also did mention this, that Office 2013 was coming to Windows Phone, Windows RT, and Symbian as well. Meanwhile, Microsoft released an update to Windows 8 released to manufacturing. Windows president Steve Sunoski Sanofsky posted that the update would be seamlessly available to all Windows 8 machines when they boot up on October 26th. Lenovo unveiled several new Windows machines, so let's run them down. There's, there's the Lenovo IdeaPad Lynx, a $599 tablet running Windows 8. Then there's the Yoga, the laptop with that crazy hinge that lets you fold back the screen. You can get it later this month, and it's going to cost you $1,100. A smaller Yoga will hit in December running Windows RT, and that's going to be $800. Oh, and there's a twist. Yeah, the ThinkPad twist. It's a convertible laptop. It's $850. I want the uh, the picture that they were showing of the yoga where it, it show, it's supposed to show it in motion, but it's got 15 screens. I just want that. Like, just 
like a big Rolodex of screens. Uh, Dishonored is Arcane Studios and Bethesda's new first-person stealth action steampunkish adventure game that's out today. Amazingly, it does not seem to be a sequel to another video game, and the press adores it. It's got 9 out of 10 or 4 out of 5 or higher from almost every major reviewer. The game costs 60 bucks and is available for PS3, Xbox 360, and Windows personal computers. Huawei and ZTE are facing trouble in the great white north. So here's the deal. Canada is putting together a network for phone calls and data. Prime Minister Harper's spokesman told a news conference yesterday that the Canadian government has invoked a national security exception that lets it discriminate when choosing partners without violating international trade rules. The spokesman said, I'll leave it to you if you think Huawei should be part of a Canadian government security system. <laughs> Seriously. Microsoft has new game content usage rules, which aim to put a damper on machinima. Uh, the new rule covering Microsoft made games like Halo, Fable, Forza Motorsport allows users to post game captured footage to websites only if the poster makes no money off the posting. So, in other words, you can put your machinima on YouTube, but you can't money mo monetize it. You can't be a partner. you got to turn off the ads. Can't monetize your machinima? That's yeah. too bad. Uh, that's bad news. Well, good news, everyone. Uh, the, spa blind. the SpaceX Dragon capsule bursts with the International Space Station on Wednesday morning. Over the next few days, astronauts will unload groceries and equipment. The Dragon will stay berthed to the station for a few weeks and will splash down in the Pacific Ocean. Man, grocery delivery. In space. Not same day delivery. Took a little bit. <laughs> they need to get eBay on that. Uh, this episode of Tech News Today brought to you by MailRoute.net. Do you do you not want spam? You don't want spam. Nobody wants spam. Uh, that's what MailRoute's for. Uh, also, if you're uh, migrating from Postini to another email filtering service, check out MailRoute. MailRoute offers a live support and an easy one-click sign-up process. You can migrate from Postini to MailRoute today and receive inbound email protection services free of charge for the remainder of your Postini contract. They make it easy. And their customer support is what's key. When you call or email MailRoute, a service ticket is automatically generated and you receive a call back within the hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. MailRoute is a hosted email filtering service and believe me, it works. I, I've resurrected uh, more than one email address, frankly, that I thought was gone forever uh, because I made the mistake in the 90s of having all my email to subbrilliant.com uh, emailed to the same address, which meant Every subbrilliant.com email address that could be created became a spam haven. But MailRoute filters 97% of the messages I get out, which means all the spam goes out, all the good stuff stays in. So try it free. Uh, you can visit MailRoute.net, click the sign up button, and enter the promo code TNT to start your 15-day free trial. It's great for enterprises, great for small businesses, but they do individuals as well. So get that 10% off for the life of your account. You don't need to give them a credit card or anything to start the free trial. That's MailRoute.net. Click the sign-up button and enter the promo code TNT. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right, let's talk about these stories we've uh, been kicking around in the news fuse. And uh, to discuss them with us, we're very happy to have uh, someone from across the ocean. Now, yesterday I thought it was going to be Ewan Rankin, but we he, we got a little confusion. He's coming on Thursday, but we have someone from France. Patrick Beja joins us on the show today. Hey, Patrick. Hey, guys. How's it going? It's going well. Thanks for being on the show, man. I am always delighted to be on the show. I was going to say surprised and delighted, but I am just going to say <laughs> How delighted. do you schedule a surprise? He's always surprised because we actually don't tell him. We just, yeah, we just dial him up. <laughs> uh, no, it's great to have you. And uh, let's start. We got lots of windows. It's going to be half windows today, uh, which you don't usually hear people complaining about. Uh, but we'll there's, there's a lot episode. of these. Let's start with those Lenovo laptops. Yeah, so there, we have a lot more details on the on those Lenovo notebooks. Now, yesterday, a bunch of NDAs lifted. So like around 7 o'clock Eastern, you saw like thousands of posts about this. There's the Idea Tab Lynx tablet. This is a $600 Intel tablet, okay? So it's, it's, it runs full Windows 8, 11.6-inch display, 1366 by 768 IPS display, 2 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, it can have 32 or 64 gigabytes of flash. And, of course, that Atom processor means you're going to be able to run full Windows 8. It does have a keyboard dock, which is not included. It costs $150 extra. And a lot of people are saying with the hands-on time, it's a little bit on the chintzy side because it's the idea tab. It's not a ThinkPad. Uh, but there is a ThinkPad twist. This brings back, like, a really old form factor. I don't know if you guys remember the first generation of tablet PCs, but you'd be able to take the screen and twist it and bring it back down. That's what the twist is. It's a convertible tablet, 850, 12 uh, and a half inch display, same resolution display. It, why this matters, by the way, for Windows 8 is that... Is you airplanes. Have, oh, no. No. Ahead. What matters for... 1366 by 768 allows you to have that snap interface. So if you want to have one application on the left, 
and one on the right for Metro. Which, believe me, if you haven't used that a lot, you think, well, that's stupid. Why do you care? I use it all the time. It's incredibly handy. Yeah, the like for in what situation? Every for morning example. when I've got my uh, my RSS reader in one browser mm -hmm. and I've got the Tech News Today lineup in the other to go back and forth between all the stories, boom, 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 boom. I thought it was stupid when Microsoft made a big deal out of it, but it just makes it easy to snap those things to the side and move back and forth between them. I mean, crack me up because it's effectively a windowed interface, but they just snap. <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but it just makes it easy. And then there's the two yogas that were introduced back at CES. They showed off this this laptop and it had that crazy hinge. But, I mean, there's a 13-inch $1,100, but I was not aware that there's an 11-inch one coming out in December. This one's going to be running an NVIDIA Tegra 3 chip, 2 gigabytes of DDR3 memory, 11.6-inch display instead of having a 13-inch display as the as the Windows, uh, the Intel version will have. Mm. So it's, it's definitely a really interesting line from Lenovo coming out, and they've also said that they're not really afraid of the Surface. They go, the Surface is simply a tablet, but this is Lenovo's lineup for Windows 8. Do any of these particular computers or form factors get anyone excited for the next crop of laptops? Because, I mean, we've been kind of waiting around for what's next. And a lot of these things seem like touched first. It's Windows 8. It seems ready for it. Every time I'm on an airplane and I've got my MacBook Pro set in front of me and somebody leans back, I wish I could twist <laughs> the display. Uh, you know, and, and, and I know that would make the keyboard go the wrong way. But, but just, just the ability to have some flexibility... Uh, is, is but then, attractive. But then the whole thing would be closer to you if you could rotate it. Yeah, I know. You know, so it's like, I, I guess if you're nearsighted, not a problem. But if you want to, you know, be back not, from your movie a little bit. It doesn't solve that. I Yeah. I, Patrick, can you think of any reasons why this twist is more than just kind of a cool looking thing? Is there a practical reason for it? Um, if it's light enough, then yes, sure. I mean, the the twist is sort of the the old um, uh, fantasy of of tablet PCs, right? As as you were saying, uh, I as it's it's sort of that thing that is both machines, and it's something that we haven't solved yet uh, because we have there uh, there is an attractiveness to uh, to tablets, and there is an attractiveness to having an, an actual. Uh, an actual PC, and if they manage to 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 solve that issue, and it's that's a big if, um, I think there is definitely a value to it. Um, now, the, the one that really interests me is that uh, Lynx tablet, which is, uh, to my, I think it's the cheapest real Windows 8. Uh, uh, tablet that we've seen announced. Maybe there are going to be a few more that come out with the new uh, versions of the Atom uh, pro pro, uh, CPU. Uh, and it's a little bit light on the RAM side. You know, it only has two gigs and things like that. But still, for $600, uh, it's a tablet and it can also run these uh, this real desktop Windows apps if you really need them. So I think, that, and, and it also has that uh, specific uh, resolution that allows you to have those two applications side by side in the t tablet mode. Basically, a, a tiny form of multitasking in tablet mode, which, by the way, no one has solved yet except for Windows. Even Android, where you have multitasking, you don't have them both at the same time on, on the on the screen. Um, so that one is attractive to me, I think, especially for the price point. But uh, Now, we'll Acer see. did, they introduced a, an Iconia yesterday that was $500. So it starts at $499 mm. with an Intel chip, and it has that display. So it just seems like, I mean, if you want to get an Acer, you spend $500. If you want a Lenovo, you spend $500, uh, $600. It's really, really incredibly low-priced because a lot of people were concerned when it, came, when it came to the Intel versions of these tablets. Are they going to be competitive with the iPad? And if $599 or $499 for a full-fledged Windows 8 desktop experience and the tablet interface, that seems like that's pretty incredible, especially that means the RT stuff is going to be even cheaper. And who knows, like, who knows what the AMD stuff is going to cost? All right, uh, we got lots of other Microsoft news. Uh, but Steve Ballmer speaking to shareholders today. Uh, an announcement, that, as we mentioned in the news news, that Office coming to iOS and Android. Where, where do we start, Sarah? Well, um, uh, Mr. Ballmer, uh, yes, did speak to shareholders and, and really kind of hammered home that Microsoft is a new company. Um, of course, he's talking about specifically the Surface Tablet and Windows 8, both coming on October 26. He said, quote, this is a significant shift. It impacts how we run the company, how we develop new experiences, and how we take products to market for both consumers and businesses. He says Microsoft will continue to work with loyal partners on Windows PCs, on tablets, on phones, 
But, quote, there will be times when we build specific devices for specific purposes and all our work with partners and on our own devices, we will focus relentlessly on delivering helpful, seamless experiences across hardware, software, and services. He pointed to the Xbox as another good example besides the Surface of a time when Microsoft building hardware for a specific pers- purpose ended up making sense. Did you just growl? I, I did. <laughs> uh, it was an involuntary <laughs> growl. Uh, because I I have been suspecting that internally Microsoft has been looking at the success of Xbox and looking at the money it's making and saying, wait, we need to replicate that in, in the other areas because we can't rely on Windows forever. and We need mm-hmm. to do it before the decline of Windows on the desktop in this post-PC era. And I don't think that you can replicate what they did in Xbox. It's an entirely different arena. Yeah, this is a bunch of the partners kind of going, what's up, Microsoft? What are you doing? I mean, go ahead and, and release your own tablet. But the Xbox is a, is, it's a very apples and oranges kind of uh, comparison. I think Microsoft... You know, I... I go ahead, Patrick. Uh, sorry, I, I really don't think he's just talking about... The- only talking about building their own devices is he he's, he's talking about reinventing the company completely and and crafting windows 8 and their philosophy going forward uh, in a different way than they have in the past and i i honestly can't believe how cynical uh, the tech press is being about windows 8 with all that you know voodoo thinking of well one out of two windows versions is crappy so this one might you know is probably going to be crappy it's 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 they are analyzing the market and they're being clairvoyant enough to to jeopardize to to you know put in peril their previous way of doing business in a way that very few companies are capable of doing uh in it all over history and we always uh criticize old companies and dinosaurs for not being able to change the way they operate. And when someone does, and someone as massive as Microsoft, we go ahead and go like, oh, but what are you doing? You're changing everything. This is <laughs> very unsettling for me. It's, well, it's, I don't understand it. it, it is, it's not just that they're changing everything. I'll, I'll agree with you. Criticizing them just for changing, uh, which a lot of people do, is, is, is pretty shallow. But are they changing in the right way? This is their IBM moment. IBM had to shift many times. Uh, they they had had to shift from being a tabulating machine company to a, a you know a, a big supercomputer company, and from a supercomputer company to a personal computer company. Remember, they weren't in the personal computer business until sure. the early 1980s, and then they had to shift out of the personal computer business into being an enterprise company and a software as a services company and a cloud company. Uh, they are one of the few companies that have been able to make those shifts over and over again to stay in front of the game. Microsoft has been a Windows company since the 80s uh and this is their chance to make a shift and they're i think it's logical for them to look at like what have we done that has worked well the xbox has worked so maybe we can translate that but i don't know that that's the right reason to make but a th- shift this way but but they're not doing the xbox for computers i mean they're doing the they're doing their version their evolved version of what ios and android are and they're recognizing that this is where they need to be where, where they need to play you know this is where the game is going to be played now um and, and they don't make operating systems the, for other game consoles they do make the operating systems for the other tablets and phones and, that, and pcs and that's exactly the kind of thinking that will lead you to not wanting to change the way you're operating your business, right? It, it's it's trying to preserve that old business model. I think the, the, the dirty secret in there is that Microsoft is seeing itself as maybe more of a, well, I think uh, uh, Bulmer even said it, more of an Apple-like company uh, controlling the experience because that's what, co- okay, Maybe this is going on too long, and please stop me uh, if it is. But the the c- computers haven't worked in the way that we hoped they would, meaning that every normal people, people who are not us, don't master the computer today, right? So we need to change the, 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 the whole computer industry to bring the power of computers to everyone, even if it's just to check emails and browse the web. And the the previous way of doing... of uh, ration of, of the philosophy of computing is not adapted to the whole population. We thought everyone was going to be a master of computers, you know, 30 years ago, and they're not. So 
uh, th this is at the basis of what Microsoft is doing. And if it does imply that they're going to be a little bit harsher with their partners in order to survive in the world of tomorrow where the exp experiences are controlled, I don't think that we can say, I, I don't think we can be as uh, skeptical as everyone is being. And maybe it's because I like uh, you know, Windows 8 a little bit too much. So well, Microsoft. maybe you don't like it. Microsoft, I mean, they're a software company when it co comes to their heart, right? That's what they do. They were making operations. They don't systems. have to be. Well, that's what they were. And the thing is, what the deal, right now they're looking at the reality. Their hardware partners could move to Android with no hurdle right now. They need to find a way to go, okay, look, if, we're, if, if nobody else is going to make or use our software, we better do it because otherwise we're going to go extinct. They need to do that, and that's why they also need to have those apps on iOS and Android. Which is not very Apple-like of them at all. No. I to, mean... To be open and available to everybody. I don't know everybody. how he can even say, this is a very, you know, it's, we're almost more like an Apple type of a company where we have our software on someone else's device that we don't control. Which is why we're making Microsoft control. Office for Apple. Wait, wait, yeah. Not just on OS X, but that, now on iOS well, as well. That's not what he was talking about. He was saying that they have in integrated experiences with devices that they make themselves and control from beginning to end. But it's, this is the fundamental problem with Windows 8, in my opinion is the fundamental problem with the strategy. They're saying, we're going to be like Apple. We're going to control the system. We're going to have the Microsoft Surface. And we're going to be like Microsoft and have Windows available for multiple partners to use. And we're going to make our software available on multiple platforms. Mm -hmm. Windows 8's doing the same thing. They're like, we're going to be a tablet operating system. And we're going to have these big boxes so it's easy for a touchscreen interface. But we're also going to still be a desktop operating system hidden underneath. I'm and, still and skeptical that that can work in either of those situations. If you had told me a few months ago, we're going to make a system, an interface that works for touch, uh, pen, and mouse, I would have told you, you are insane, it can't be done, and you're going to end up with a subpar interface uh, uh, UI for all three. But they've pulled it off. And I was extremely surprised have that they? it works as well as it does. You don't think so? Well, Microsoft, has, they do have sure. a bunch of ads explaining exactly how to use Windows right now. They leaked a couple of days ago. There's like four ads that were found on an Israeli site, I think. It was, everything was written in Hebrew, so I can't read it. And uh, if you see these ads, they explain how Windows 8 works. And the thing is, because it's that huge learning curve, when it comes to Windows 8, they have to make these ads. They have to explain that, by the way, everything you know doesn't exist. And what Patrick said is something that's actually in the ad. It says touch, mouse, or keyboard. And like, it shows you you have all these options. A lot of things I think a lot of people are slightly afraid of. Oh, and by the way, you know that whole RTM thing, Windows 8 RTM? Like, there's a huge update to it. So I guess it wasn't too RTM right away. Updates are all under the hood. Steven Sanofsky says that the update is improving performance, power management, battery efficiency, media playback, all that stuff. So all the apps got changed. So Windows 8, whether it's baked or not, everything is changed again. So everything we're talking about could be totally different by tomorrow because Microsoft's pushing huge well, updates. No, this is bug fixes. This is, that's what Sanofsky's saying is, look, when you turn on your machine, you're going to have to go through a really long bug fix procedure. This is what Intel was talking about uh, when they were, you know, that, that leaked conversation when they said, uh, yeah, Microsoft Windows isn't ready yet, but it will be. Don't worry. This is, this is the don't worry part. Uh, this is where they, they fix a lot of the device driver issues. Uh, the question is, 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 that, is it going to fix everything? Uh, are they are they gonna is it gonna be enough? Uh, and is Windows 8 going to be popular? We don't know. Um, I want I do want to get back to the Microsoft Office stuff though because I thought I, th I thought that was really fascinating that while we're talking about all of this strategy for Microsoft, they are still they are going to roll Office out across platforms. So they're hedging their bets again in another way. And this is something that has been rumored for a while. Uh, and Microsoft had said, without giving any firm dates, spokespeople for the company had said, yeah, you know, the, it, it, we'll, we'll, we'll make something for iOS eventually. But it has been confirmed, um, not only to a, a Czech uh, site um, by uh, product manager Peter Bobek, who was uh, speaking at a conference. It was a press event in the Czech Republic. Um, but then also a press release um, that The Verge picked up. Um, from the, the Microsoft team over in the Czech Republic um, that said, yeah, iOS and Android and Symbian and Windows Phone and RT and Mac OS and just about everybody, everybody will be able to use Office. It's not going to be free, so sure, I guess they'd, 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 they make some money there. Uh, but I, I guess as somebody who doesn't, I, I do not have a Windows machine. I haven't for a few years. I'm very interested in all of this stuff, you know, partly because we talk about it, so I know a lot of the details, and it's kind of exciting. And partly because it's going to be a very different Windows experience than the last Windows machine I had. That's for sure. 
um, you know, whenever I end up buying one or playing with somebody else's, you know, I'll borrow Ayaz's laptop or something. But if I don't have to use a Windows machine for something that is very ubiquitous with Windows to me, then that's just less of a reason to switch, especially if I'm in the enterprise. You know, there are, I think there are a lot of people in the enterprise who you will know, bring your own device. That's all fine and good. Office comes to iOS in my case. Oh, okay, cool. Now I have that part of Microsoft that I know and love already. And this brings me back around to what Patrick was saying, which maybe if you look at any individual silo, it may or may not work. It may or may not make sense. But Microsoft is putting bets across the board. They're, they're covering the table. Like that's not maybe we'll be a, maybe we'll end up being a good software company that's cross-platform even if, if the operating system becomes less important. So we're putting Microsoft Office out everywhere, and and we've learned a lot about hardware. So let's try controlling the Surface experiment, but let's not undermine our previous business. Let's work with the partners and find out it, what they want. This may be the smartest approach of all, which is to say let's try all of these things that look possible, and then when one of them catches on and starts to work, we'll go full speed ahead on that. I honestly don't really don't think that's what they're doing. It's them analyzing the market. And in this specific instance of, of uh, um, Office uh, 2013, they're just, they just know that they need to be available everywhere in order to remain the dominant, you know, uh, uh, office suit. Just as, uh, to, to come back to what uh, Sarah was saying earlier, Apple knew, uh, and I found the, the, the little... Uh, counterpoint there apple knew at one point that they needed to have their itunes software on the two you know on windows and they did it it, it wasn't like we're trying to hedge our bets that the, the market dictated that in order to keep their position or to grow it even more they needed to do it so they just did what they needed to do all right let's bef bef let's finish up the microsoft conversation with ias telling us what's actually coming in the update okay. to windows 8 rtm so the rtm updates are performance updates that's on under the hood there's also a huge update to all the microsoft apps including mail you get imap support which i was surprised wasn't in there conversation view photos gets crop and rotate abilities SkyDrive lets you search and rename things apps like travel and sports support video and one of the bigger things for the windows 8 update is driver compatibility so all the fears that were ahead were coming ahead or spoken about before that should be well hopefully taken care of because microsoft wants everything to work with their partners all right let's take a quick break and uh thank our sponsor squarespace.com the new squarespace faster and easier than ever to create a high quality website blog or online portfolio if you haven't tried it out go give it a shot right now you don't have to give them a credit card or anything you just put in the name of your website and you're off to the races uh you can start creating a beautiful new website squarespace is updated now with html5 css3 javascript json it's fast it's flexible uh it's got beautiful templates uh, that you can customize, but they start out looking great. So as soon as you kind of make it look your own, you can start dragging and dropping in your things. It's a, it's a WYSIWYG sort of feel. Uh, and when you put in your images, they process each one of them into seven sizes so your site looks right no matter what device people are looking at your website on, whether it's a phone or a tablet. Uh, building a page has never been easier, so go give it a shot. Try out Squarespace. You don't have to take our word for it. You don't have to give them, like I said, any credit card information or anything. If you do decide to purchase Squarespace, use the offer code TNT10 and get 10% off your first purchase on new Squarespace accounts. And don't forget, monthly account gives you 10% off the first month. A yearly account gives you 10% off an entire year. And you get a free domain name when you sign up for a yearly registration. So that's squarespace.com. Use that offer code TNT10 if you do decide to keep it. Uh, and let them know you heard about it on uh, Tech News Today. We really appreciate Squarespace's continuing support of the show. We do have some non-Microsoft news to talk about today. Uh, RSA, having their annual conference up there in London, announced a, uh, a nifty distributed credential protection system, which essentially splits hashed and encrypted passwords into two parts. What this does is if an attacker gets into a server, they only get part of the password, they'll have to go in and find the other server, attack that, get into that, put the passwords together. However, the idea is if you detect that someone is attacking your server, you'll be able to go change the other server so that they won't be able to match the password pieces up. An attacker would have to break into both servers before the breach is detected in order to make it successful. Now, some people say, well, this is great and all, uh, but a lot of attacks that get passwords are social engineering or they're phishing schemes, and this doesn't protect against that, and that's true. But that doesn't mean it's, it's bad encryption. However... This advance is overshadowed a little bit by RSA Executive Chairman Art Coviello uh, in his 
keynote talking about knee-jerk privacy. He might be reacting to the UK communications data bill, which allows law enforcement to get ISP customer data without a warrant. In some cases, there's been a huge backlash against that. Uh, or he might just be reacting to the fact that they would like to have a lot of data to use in their software uh, and use in their analysis. Uh, there's something called security information and events management systems that just need lots of data. And they have a hard time getting that data because of privacy rules. Uh, he said... Where is it written that cyber criminals can steal our identities, but any industry action to prevent to protect us invites cries of Big Brother? Essentially saying, you know, we need to balance privacy protection against the need to have this data to be able to fight the bad guys. Nick Pickles, director of privacy campaign group Big Brother Watch, told Tech Week Europe to suggest the only way to protect against cybercrime is to sacrifice privacy and civil liberties is absurd. So this is this is a continuing conversation. RSA, big company, they want to limit privacy. Uh, they, they don't want to eliminate privacy protection, but they want to limit it so that they can do their work. And, of course, privacy protection organizations say, no, we need to have as much privacy as possible. Patrick, where do you come down on this? Uh, it's a really difficult question. Um, of course, the easy, you know, it's very easy to go all... Uh, we have to protect privacy for everything. And of course, we need, of course, privacy needs to be protected. Uh, if we lived in an ideal world, then we wouldn't even have these issues, but we do. And I guess that at, to some uh, degree, then there is a need for limit, maybe not limiting privacy, but examining how much uh, privacy we need to give up in order to make sure that systems are are you know properly protected i don't know it's it's i don't have a definitive uh opinion on this i i it is it's a tough question because on the one hand i do think that when he says knee jerk privacy i've felt that before that well, you know what? It's a different world we live in, and not every p single piece of our personal information needs 100% protection. You know, our, our names are out there in public, uh, and we've talked about all that before. On the other hand, as soon as a large corporation gets up there and starts saying it, you start to go, well, wait a minute, buddy. You, Why are you saying this? Because you have an interest in stealing my data without my knowledge, and I want to make sure I protect the data that's mine. Uh, and, and, and I can see the other side. I can see the skepticism. Uh, you guys, uh, Ayaz, you got an opinion? I think I have the same thing, the same opinion you do. Like, I do have that, I have the knee-jerk reaction of, why is this guy doing this? But then again, I want to take it as, as objectively and be like, well, maybe there is a lot of data out there, and I, I found it strange, like, Facebook's a great example of this. All the data you put up on Facebook, a lot of that stuff was in the phone book. I mean, I don't know why people didn't freak out about that. But when it's on Facebook, oh my gosh, it's on Facebook. Like, well, who cares? It was, it's already been published and distributed to people's doorsteps. So, I mean... There, there's it's it's always different once you find out your data can be collected and analyzed and used and figured and, and more things can be figured out about you so it's just a delicate balance you got to figure out exactly where to go but i mean i don't know if i, I don't know if, if if the rsa uh president is right or wrong i got to think about it some more. it's one of the situations where it's like if there was some specific case where uh, you know, law enforcement was spying on certain conversations and getting some data and ended up nabbing some really bad guys before something terrible happened. We'd all go, yeah, well, that was... That was worth it. Glad that happened. Privacy issues are kind of weird there, but that, this was a case where it was a good thing. You know, so it's like we don't... There's no way to know if everything was out in the open or if it wasn't allowed at all, what's actually benefiting from 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 laws like this so yeah i mean i think it's a really gray area of course it makes people uncomfortable you know the privacy issue is really important it's a it's, it's a big deal to some people it's everything um i think i'm a little bit more somewhere in the middle rsa is not saying uh we want you to give us all your social security number and your bank account information and all of that sort of thing but they're saying if we're surveying out there and we log some ip addresses and we law and we set a cookie and we re and, and we record some history uh and we suck that into our siem uh database and we use that for analytics to figure out some traffic patterns so that we can find out you know where the worms are and who's sending traffic to who and 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 we can set up some honeypots that capture information that helps us fight the bad guys 
And if you if you don't let us do that because you put these 100% privacy laws saying you can't log an IP address and you can't keep data for longer than a few days, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it gets in the way of their job. And I think that's a reasonable objection. On the other hand, I think that, you know, if I'm looking at a corporation versus a, you know, a, a privacy advocacy organization, I'm going to lean toward the privacy advocacy organization because their vested interest is protecting me, whereas the corporation's vested interest is making money off me. And I want to know how they're making money off me. I want protection for that. I think there is, a, just to finish off there, uh, I think there are two really important elements or maybe three. Uh, Sarah, the the as you exactly what you were saying we need to have specific cases because this is very vague you know in this this theoretical debate and then we need to know exactly what they're using it for right in in which context they're going to aggregate the the data how they're going to be using it and i want ballot uh, you know checks and balances in some way i want someone who knows what he, this all means to make sure that RSA, RSA, uh, sorry, RSA isn't doing something nefarious with the data. I don't want to give them free reign, definitely not. So, If you want to hear more about these sorts of issues and maybe find out a little more about distributed credential protection, which we glossed over a bit, uh, by all means, go to twit.tv slash SN, subscribe to Security Now, or watch it on Wednesdays right here uh, at live.twit.tv because uh, Steve Gibson knows these issues backwards and forwards, and, and he'll, he'll, he'll go to town on this stuff, I have, I have no doubt. Uh, let's move on to Twitter buying the video firm Vine. We just had a story yesterday suspecting that Twitter might be bringing video in-house. I guess this is how they're going to do it. Well, huh? I mean, this is at least one way they're trying to get into the video space without relying on third-party programs. Um, you know, YFrog and TwitVid were a couple that we threw out yesterday as, as the kind of video services that you see people linking to on Twitter a lot. The deal with Vine is it's a three-person company. They're based in New York. Uh, they only formed back in June, and they weren't public. So, I mean, I know a few people who were using it. One is M.G. Siegler, who's my partner, but he's a he's an investor in Crunch Fund. So I actually got to see it in action. And the deal is, is that okay? I'm, we're looking at for the video folks. It look it's like an, a loop of very short video clips, right? They're looping just because that's what the permalink does. But the idea is that okay, you know, in this situation, you're on a boat, you're watching the Blue Angels. You could have, you know, a 15 to uh, 20 second video that maybe captured something really interesting, or you could have more of a collage of videos that sort of invokes the atmosphere of the day. And you see a lot more in a short period of time. Of course, the thinking being not only does this give you a little bit more variety, but most people don't really want to click on videos. We're all busy. And, you know, I've said this before is that if I have a service where there are photos and then there are videos and, and maybe quotes and updates, the videos are the ones I click on the very least because I just don't know what I'm getting. They're the most intrusive. They require yeah, multiple senses. They do. Yes. You know, you're not sort of scrolling along. You yeah. have to pay a lot more attention. Now, of course, with something like Vine, the service, and we don't know how it's going to change under Twitter all things D reported, it's possible that Vine would stay a standalone service for now. You can kind of think of it as the way that Facebook says, Instagram, it's its own thing. We own it, but it's its own, own thing, at least for the foreseeable future. But I love the idea of, so my, I, my feelings about Vine are, I think it's going in the right direction as far as we have very short attention spans. Video can be kind of boring. It's too much to ask uh, most people who are shooting uh, video on the fly to do any sort of editing, you know, to cut it down. So Vine sort of does this for you. It's a little choppy. Mm -hmm. It could be finessed a bit, but I like the idea. I also think when it comes to Twitter, this makes a lot of sense, especially for citizen journalism, crowdsourced, uh, um, uh, I don't know, news gathering when you're on the scene. I mean, that's how Twitter works so well anyway. So this is kind of that short form, let's collect visual um, news uh, rather than just the 140 character news together, I think this is pretty exciting. And they can embed it in the stream better, uh, like they do with images. Yeah, you. you I mean, I, I would assume that would be the way that, that this would be rolled out. Um, the co-founders, by the way, used to work at Jet Setter, which is Guilt Group's travel site, which is very different than Vine. So um, it, it's, you know, it's it's they've had an interesting year. Um and then I noticed in some of the uh, conversations online about this, people saying, well, Vine isn't new. I mean, what about something like Tout? Tout is another example of a short 
video service where you can only upload up to six, uh, 15 seconds at a time. 12 seconds was another service that came and went. It was uh, pretty popular a few years ago. But that's a little different because you're limited to 15 seconds, but it's not that collage. It's not that montage of different different videos. I've used services like 12 seconds and tow I think 12 seconds went away. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, but one of the things you're doing when you're setting that up is like you're trying to fit something within that time limit. You want to make sure that you're actually in that. Vine works so differently that you just will take parts of clips. So you might have just taken a bunch of videos in that day and then go, oh, I'll put that together on Vine. Definitely seems like it's very in line with Twitter because that's short form, like you were saying, Sarah, short form content, short form video. That's pretty hard to do because people, as even though they have the ability to edit on their phones, or iPads or tablets or computers, they don't. And if you want people to actually look at these videos and be engaged, and this is what Twitter wants, wants you to be engaged, these short videos might might do it. I think it's it's a really good fit for Twitter. All right, we mentioned earlier this week uh, that uh, Huawei and ZTE came under fire from the U.S. Congress uh, Committee uh, on Intelligence, and uh, there's been some reactions now. Canada. Uh, is invoking their national security exception and building a new network for government voice and data. Sarah told you about that in the news fuse, allowing them to discriminate without violating trade rules. Representative Mike Rogers also urging Canadian companies not to do business specifically with Huawei. Uh, what's interesting about this is Huawei Technologies Canada spokesman Scott Bradley pointed out that Huawei is fully incorporated in Canada and the security exception applies only to foreign companies. So they plan to bid on this network anyway. Uh, the EU Trade Commissioner, Carol de Gucht, is uh, gathering evidence in order to launch an anti-dumping or anti-subsidy case. Uh, but no European company has complained about Huawei or ZTE. So it's it's hard to launch an investigation when you don't have a complaint to act on in this case. Australia has already barred Huawei specifically from taking part in contracts to build the government's uh, $38 billion national broadband network. A lot of people feel that that was under pressure from the United States that they did that. Um, the Intelligence Committee came out today and said they've received dozens and dozens of calls complaining about Huawei and ZTE. That's what Reuters uh, reports doesn't sound like that many calls, frankly. Uh, UK Cabinet Office told V3, a, uh, a reporting firm in, in the UK, a cybersecurity evaluation center was set up in 2010, which enables government experts to work with Huawei to give assurance that their products meet security standards. So before Huawei can sell the devices in the UK, the UK has to look at them and make sure that they can't find anything wrong with them. This all looks like a lot of governments don't trust Huawei, and that none of them can prove why. And Huawei themselves says, look, it would kill our business if anyone discovered any kind of backdoor uh, or anything. Now, you can say, well, they're just cleverly hiding it. But as we know, on the Internet, with hackers looking for things, and hackers, believe me, are going to start looking at Huawei devices specifically now, nothing stays secret for long. So it's not much different than the conversation we had earlier this week. Do you trust Huawei? Do you trust ZTE or not? But we didn't have Patrick here to talk about it earlier <laughs> this week. And we have all of these other reactions where the U.K. is saying, you know, we're, we're working with Huawei. We don't see any problem uh, and we have very strict standards. You see, uh, you see, dozens and dozens of calls. Frankly, it just doesn't sound What's like a 20, huge, an overwhelming 30, reaction. Yeah. Patrick, what do you think of this? I I want to know who's calling and why. Uh, specifically about this. This is uh, out of all of this. I want to know those dozens of calls. Is it like people picking up the phone and saying, "Yeah, I don't like Huawei spying on my, you know, computers." I, I'm not sure what that is. Is it people from Cisco? Uh, like, yeah, keep them out Probably. of our market. Um, I mean, this is, again, a super difficult uh, position, right? If, he, if you're in any position to legislate or, or regulate about this, you don't want to be the one guy who says, ah, oh, you're being, like, racist. Because basically we're singling out a Chinese or two Chinese companies, right? Their, their only crime or alleged crime is to be, you know, Chinese. And you don't want to be the one pointing that out because if there is something nefarious going on and it turns out that they steal trade secrets from some immensely proud national company, then you're going to be the one, you know, who everyone's going to point to and say, look, that's his fault. Um, it's, again, one of those difficult situations. I'm not sure there is a right answer. I was going to say I'm not sure I have a right answer, but I don't think there is a right answer here. Well, Unless, there, there, uh, until we know more. Yeah, exactly. No, they, they, until we know more. There, there's a right answer out there somewhere, and somebody knows it. Somebody somebody in China is sitting there either saying, oh, man, they're on to us, or I don't know why they want, what we could do to get them to trust us. We really aren't 
putting anything. Uh, and, and, and there are definite reasons for mistrust, but there yet does not seem to be any evidence for mistrust. Uh, well, I, I don't think we're, we're at war with China, right? What, what, except for the fact that they're a communist country, which I understand we hate. And there's a former uh, PLA uh, member in charge of the company. I think that, that's one, right. another big reason that there's, there's problems here. Okay, right. But surely you can find, you know, former government members in other countries that have transitioned into a, become a, a position in a company. Um, I, I, I mean, legally and, and even politically, what is the reason for not trusting China more than other countries? Why are, aren't we worried about Australia? Well, because well, there is a bit of a, of a cold cyber war. Uh, I mean, there, there's definitely spying going on on both sides. Yeah, I mean, Israel has reasons to integrate, you know, in systems, things that will get information back to them as well. Aren't we, you know, we're not looking. Anyway, and I'm sure no, no Middle Eastern country uh, that opposes Israel is going to buy any networking equipment from Israel for the, exactly the same that's reasons. True. That's true. That's true. But uh, yeah, I mean, as you were saying, within like three months, three to six months, if we haven't heard anything from the hacking community uh, uh, about Huawei having uh, things that call home, I think we're safe to use Huawei equi equipment. All right. Uh, shall, shall we move on to the randomizer then? Please. All right. Let's. Randomizer. Because we're going to charge our smartphones with fire. Cool. Fire! Little fires? Uh, no, actual burning fire. Burning fire. Okay. BioLite Camp Stove is a biomass burning stove that cooks your food. And it actually was invented to reduce the uh, emissions because, uh, especially in developing countries, it was a problem with people out cooking their food that they, they would poison them. They would monoxide poison themselves. So they created this stove that burns biomass, low emissions, but also can cook your food while charging small electronic devices or even flashlights. Love it. Um, I hope that it doesn't make the smartphones too hot. <laughs> well, it's a cord. It yeah. goes over to the stove. Well, One side, you leave. I mean, the picture, the picture didn't make it seem like the phone was too far away from the actual flame. Well, I'm, I, I would think if you're going to invest in this, you get yourself a USB extension cable while you're at it. Because you don't want to <laughs> oh, put your... Oh, great. Another expense. That's, well, otherwise, you're going to be toasting your iPhone. Do you want to uh, toast your iPhone on an open <laughs> no, fire? No, I don't. That's the whole point. I don't, I don't want to think, toast your I, iPhone. I, it's not that close. I think it's fine. It's not going to toast your it's iPhone. It's not a tremendous fire either in this. In this, It's like... It's all Maybe they yellow. include the warning, you know, in the in the package. They're like, "Be careful! This may toast your iPhone." You know, and I mean, then look at the, we're looking at a picture of of some very happy campers <laughs> roasting Literally. some marshmallows. Where is the phone? Is Ice the phone going to get up. s'more dripping on it? Yeah, the phone's burned up and yeah. gone, They've and this is all they the have left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But maybe we we read it wrong. Maybe it's uh, uh, harness the power of your phone to cook your food by burning it in this stove. You know, no, it's, no, it's the fuel. It just overclocks it's, your device you, until it burns you, up. You burn the 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 wood in the in the, the in the stove, and it creates electricity, and then you can charge your phone. I love this idea. I love it too. I mean, you could it's make great. fire from nothing, right? I saw Tom Hanks do it in that movie when he was on the island. Yeah, so that's him and Wilson. And if he had a phone that was out of batteries, he would have been able to charge it and then and call, then call somebody. And then he wouldn't have met Wilson. Well, if well, he had the might not if have been he had as close a to network. Wilson. You know, if he had coverage. I think Verizon's but, out there. Yeah, I think yeah. the only ones. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's take a, our last break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Gazelle. Uh, if you want to save up some money for a BioLite camp stove or possibly an iPhone 5 uh, or a Samsung Galaxy S3 mini, you're going to need some cash. Uh, and before you get that new phone, make sure you sell your used phone to Gazelle for cash you can use to upgrade. Now, don't say, well, wait a minute. I don't want to sell my phone yet. I haven't got the new one. That's the beauty of Gazelle. Okay. No hassle. Simple, fast. You don't have to mess with trying to coordinate anything. You just go online. Tell Gazelle gazelle.com what device you have tell them what shape it's in they'll even they'll even pay you cash for some broken iphones sometimes get a risk-free offer for your gadgets and lock in that quote for 30 days you have 30 days to go shop and buy and get your new phone and activate it then you send them the old phone and they'll pay you fast uh, by check or paypal got my money for my old iphone uh last week uh it's in my account right now and now i can go spend it on stuff uh so get, get go check take a look if you've got some old gadgets laying around that you want to get rid of uh by all means gazelle.com easiest and fastest way to do it offers are good for 30 days uh check them out gazelle.com and 
and when you're filling out the form, if you happen to uh, see a question that says, where'd you hear about it? You can tell them tech news today. You know, just let them know, hey, it was, uh, yeah, I want to support the show like you do. Thank you, gazelle.com. We appreciate your support of tech news today. What's on the calendar, Sarah? Well, Tom, it's interesting that you asked because there are mm. things on it. Mm. Uh, we mentioned yesterday that some tech firms and regulators were meeting in Geneva. Um, they have uh, met today to discuss UN patents and FRAND patents and innovations and what should be recognized as being critical to an industry standard. What's interesting is the ITU allowed journalists access to the morning talks, but then in an afternoon session, um, this is sort of at the time the parties start talking about possible compromises, um, that session was just restricted to the participants. So hopefully we'll get um, some interesting stories about what journalists were uh, allowed to hear and sit in on. And then a reminder that tomorrow, that is the Samsung uh, Mini Galaxy S3, even though it's not going to be called that, the four-inch phone. That'll be more interesting well, tomorrow. Yep. We know what it is. It's a Mini. Yeah. We already know. Mm -hmm. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. It's not like the iPad Mini. That's it's not, not going to be called a Mini, Tom. It's not even a real yeah. thing. Uh, I got an email from Lyndon in Melbourne, Australia, who says, I was watching episode 603 and the digits discussion with interest. Can't help thinking that while they are from competing companies, the ideal use case for me is pairing digits with Google Glass. The question I've always had with Glass as a concept is the input and interaction, as I'm not a big fan of voice control out and about. Using something like digits as the input controller with Glass as the display is the first time I've considered wearable computing as a potentially truly productive implementation rather than just interesting gadgetry. When I read this email, the first thing I thought of is H+, a series on YouTube uh, about these implants that we all, that everybody starts using for visual communication, and then they all go bad, and it kills a bunch of people. But that's not the thing that reminded me of this. The uh, the combination of digits and glasses is exactly what they're doing in this show. They're all waving their hands in front of their air with virtual uh, uh, virtual interfaces that just show up in, in their eyes from the implant. So maybe that's another business Microsoft could get in and partner with Google on. I doubt they're... Those, that was those exactly what... I, Lyndon kind of read my mind. When I saw that uh, Digits project thing, it was... I thought of Google Glass immediately. So I agree with you. So you're bright, Lyndon. Well done. Got another email from... Good job. From Andy Beach, who says, regarding the Hi, issue Andy. over tipping via Square at Starbucks, I happen to be a... Uh, at a Target shopping this weekend. I got a coffee from the Starbucks that was in the store, then sat when I went through my shopping list, listened to the barista, who was the store manager, explain to the next three people in line that he could not accept their tips that they were trying to give him. He elaborated that Starbucks housed within Targets are run by the store, and he is actually a Target employee. Target business guidelines don't allow employees to accept gratuities, and that extends to any retail food within the stores, uh, even Starbucks. So... And he says, I'd agree with your assessment that it's not likely the technology blocking tipping out of the gate, but Starbucks figuring out how to make the technology work with existing business policies. Man, I'd be happy if we had a system that everyone got paid well and we didn't need to tip. That's socialism, Tom. Is that, that, that's, that's, that's what socialism. we have. <laughs> But if you're tipped Communist. really, really well, and then you don't report that, well, yeah, that's yeah. a whole other story. Exactly. By the way, are there Starbucks in all Targets? I didn't know that. Lots of Targets. So they're, they're, I think the one over in uh, Oakland or Emory's in, not in Emeryville. Where is it? It's I don't know. I don't yes. really ever go there. Got There's going to be a Target in San Francisco, though. Maybe they'll have a Starbucks in Maybe there. Maybe they will. And it'll just be a one shampoo and coffee. Everything. Don't get shampoo in your coffee. No, that's not good. That's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thanks for submitting stories on our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. We do look at it when we form our lineup every morning to find out what you guys are interested in talking about. Patrick Beja, thank you for being on the show. Great insights, as always. Uh, let folks know where they can find you online. Uh, the easiest thing to do is to go to patrickbeja.com or Twitter at NotPatrick. Uh, or, you know, if you like uh, podcasts and you speak French or want to learn, fr learn French, go to nowatch.net where we have a ton of awesome shows for you. Superb. Check it out. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. This time, I promise it's true. Ewan Rankin from British Tech Mac will be on the show tomorrow. We'll see you then.